Um, well, you've seen three of our panellists. Rachel, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. Yes, I'm Rachel Ellis. I'm the Scum for Safety Director um, at Hull University Teaching Hospitals. Thank you very much. Um, so much to discuss. Quite a sort of varied sense of presentations. Um, but I, I would like to start with trust because it seems to me that it's important in terms of vaccination. But also in our first session, we talked about the use of patient data and, and you know, one of the challenges that we can all see the great potential, but there is an issue of trust and confidentiality. So I think this is a, you know, a much wider issue. But just, just on trust in relation to vaccinations, if you look at the take-up of vaccinations in, just if we take West, what we might describe as Western countries, there's a huge variation, isn't there? Uh, and that in some countries, there are, I think, what we would call myths surrounding vaccinations in, in general. How, how do we, GS1, the global family of GS1, what contribution do you think, Hannah, we can make to, to this? Well, I, I thought that's an easy question. We'll move on to world poverty in a minute. But, uh, uh, but, yeah. uh, but, we, we'll come to uh, that, yes, actually. Exactly. But, uh, uh, <laughs> look, I, 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 I mean, the, 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 my first answer is that I think it has to be something around good use of consistent data. I think, you know, what in the last pan year of the pandemic, I think we have not always done well, is we've not been very consistent. Um, and I, I think there is also a, a really interesting dialogue which happened in particular in the German-speaking countries, which have been lagging behind, in particular in Europe, for quite a bit, and including, uh, you know, valleys in Switzerland and Austria sending the vaccination vans away and saying that we don't want you. Um, but I, I think it has a lot to do with this sort of rebalancing of what is an individual right versus a public obligation. Um, and I think we are, I, I think, renegotiating what that is, and the pandemic has been... Uh, an exemplar for it. Um, and I think where standards will help is to continue to ensure that actually what you're getting is right, and maybe whether it is the best or not, but it at least is effective and it's the product that you're taking. Um, but these are also standards not just about the product itself, but also about how care is delivered. So I'm hopeful, also for world poverty. Thank you. Ulrike, I mean, um what more do you think needs to happen in, in, in the world of uh, global standards? Um, I said at the time of your uh, speech that the endorsement of WHO, UNICEF, COVID, uh, this is very important, isn't it? But we're not quite there yet, are we, in terms of both recognition and the global supply chain? No, we are not yet there. And I think one of the reasons was that... Uh, Nobody was prepared for it. I mean, let's mm. be honest. Uh, we were all not prepared. We had to face a situation which we never had. Uh, we were all just at the beginning just thinking of how to get the vaccine somehow to the patients. We were not thinking about all the related issues of counterfeiting, uh, how to really secure that the supply chain is safe and really uh, that products are there when they are needed, not too much, and, but also um, enough for everybody. And I think Hanno mentioned already uh, one of the things which I think is really important if we go into the developing countries. Um, we all have today our phones with us, and uh, we really, if somebody has an idea how we get Apple and Google to read the data metrics, as natural as the QR code today. So like Anne said this morning, so nicely, just point to the QR code and you will be linked to something. Well, I would love that uh, we can do this also with our phones for data metrics, which is on millions mm -hmm. of uh, products already today and is affecting our health care is on vaccines. And I think it's something which is really important. So if somebody in the audience has an idea how we can make that happen, please let me know, I would be really grateful. But I think that's, this technical barriers is something which you really need to work on, that systems can really encompass the GTIN, the serial number, the batch number, the lot number. That is, is really important that that is happening. So all history suggests that uh, at the moment, we're very clear we must learn the lessons 
We must make sure that when the next pandemic or global emergency happens, all of those lessons have been learned and we'll be well prepared. But reality also suggests that after time, we forget that governments actually find other ways to spend their scarce resources. Uh, I'm just wondering how do we ensure that the lessons that we've learned very, very hard that we don't forget this time around? Any thoughts? Well, Sarah, yeah. <laughs> There's a question. It's almost up there with world poverty. How to <laughs> convince governments because to Because I, I, I'm just to follow that up. Yeah. We know, for instance, that in this country yeah. there were various exercises that have been undertaken yes. about how to deal with it. Yes, some of their assumptions were not right in terms of COVID, but some were. And yet, when presented to ministers with, the, with suggestions that resources should be spent, they balance that with other priorities and, and sometimes they don't you know, follow up. I'm sure we're not alone in that in terms of our preparation. I mean, arguably, you know, you can, something like COVID, you can never fully anticipate mm. the, the global nature yeah. of thing. I think, you know, there were preparations in place for many different types of national resilience emergencies, but, but the nature of this, and I think the interconnectedness of supply chains, the interconnectedness of, of, of that sort of thing, I think really hit home when everybody simultaneously needed the same resources. Um, but I think it, you know, to put a positive spin on it, to your point, we've learned so much going through this um, from many different dimensions, from a supply chain dimension, from a patient care dimension, data, the roles that we all play in the system. So, yes, I think, um, I think everybody, we're just at that inflection point now where we've just about got enough headspace to think, how do we capture, how do we leverage, how do we build on the best of what we've been through over the last couple of years? Ulrika. Yeah, you see it in my face, right? <laughs> I, I love the, uh, the comment this morning that I think in the last two years we have seen that those hospitals who did already scanning had really an advantage, that they had a better overview of their inventory, that they knew better where products were, that there was not this panic, oh, I need to buy a mask so that I have something, which a lot of hospitals really did. And I think let's, you know that, Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the fact that this has paid off and that it's really something which is worth mm. to do from the financial side, but also from, from the human side for to be prepared really for the next one. I think this is the moment really where we kind of, let's not relax. And uh, I love the idea of a patient advocate, but we are all patient. It should be in our interest really also to raise our voices. And of course I'm biased here. But, I mean, we all want to be treated as best as possible when we go into a hospital. So let's raise our voices, really, and let's, let's ask for making this happen. It's, it's really, it's cost effective, it's safer, so why should we not do this? I'm going to bring Rachel in a minute because that yes. really, you know, lends itself to asking about her experience. But can I just stick, stick with the global supply chain for the moment? Look, looking at Sarah's uh, fantastic slides, um, the change in our approach to resilience was for me very, very interesting. And I think, and I don't know what you think, but there's clearly been political discussion in the light of the tragedy in Ukraine about where the world is going and maybe the development of separate global systems amongst countries of like minds. I, I don't expect you to you know, comment on that, but clearly there are challenges ahead that, that we've all been working on an assumption of greater globalization. COVID in itself and the supply chain issues have, I think, at least caused a pause and thinking about, well, where are we going? And if we are going to see shocks to the system, how can we nonetheless keep standards going? It's, it's a question and a half again. I think, um, I mean, I, I think what, what was interesting at the start of the pandemic for me was actually looking across other industries and mm. how some of they responded. So retail, for example, 
in the early days actually cut the product range and focused on the core range to keep the products flowing um, you know, and, and adjusted strategies from there. Clearly, as the healthcare system, we're a lot more complex than that. We don't have that flexibility. But I do think there's something in there around you know, choice to a degree, but, but trying to channel the right clinical practices, the right clinical activities, support that with the right products, and then make sure that we operate, we have visibility on where those products are. Um, you know, and there is, I think there is a, a, an inflection point around globalization of supply chains, particularly for certain categories. Um, but I think, again, that, that's sort of where the national model lends itself to being able to look across the globe and work out what the right sort of strategies are for the NHS for the future and take into account those different things and have the, 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 the leverage and the ability to do something about that. And I think that's where then standards come in because actually to operate end-to-end -end efficiency, you need to know what's at every point in the supply chain. And uh, you know, I think COVID really taught us that. Ulrika, do you, I mean, from GS1 Global, what are your thoughts about? I, I think absolutely what we have seen and where we have been really sometimes directly involved, or our colleagues have been directly involved, we have seen shipping of medicines which were missing from one country to the other. Mm. Our colleagues sometimes have helped to find where was something available still. And I think that is really talking for globalization. If you don't know what you are talking about, if you can't identify it really uniquely, then, then it's making that even more disruptive and more mm. difficult. So I think global standards are really helping there. Hannah, can we stick, will we be able to retain yeah. global standards? I, I think we, we can, and maybe I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. Mm. I think we have to. Um, I think we would not have developed the vaccines and had the response that we had in the last year had we not collaborated uh, in particular in the, in the Western world, in the way that we have. So I, 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 I think for me the only way to deal with that is to continue to build that trust and begin to institutionalize the way of working that we've had. And I think that speaks to what you said, which is both not just on the standards that we use, but also on the ways of working and beginning to think about what really works. How do we capture that, either in organizations, in people, or in, mm. uh, in new bodies that create an ability to react and better um, and, and create better supply chains in the future. So Rachel, can I bring you in? Because yes. I mean, it's been really interesting discussion about globalization and impacts. You're at the local level um, and you're director of Scan for Safety program. Could you just tell us a bit about, you know, how's it going and the challenges? Yeah, COVID's been, of course, COVID's been very difficult for staff. Um, you know, it's been very difficult for resources at the hospital. But, but actually, from a scan, pers you know, scan for safety perspective, it's actually been, um, we've had some massive benefits. So we, you know, we, we talked earlier about, about scanning all of the, the patient, mm. about scanning the products, about scanning the place, and about scanning who and what, the process. And one of the things that we actually do at Hull is that we decided early on to do some of the high risk areas. So we don't just do surgical areas, we also do wards and departments that are high risk. And one of those was around home ventilation. So this is people that require a ventilator at home for their own use within their own homes. Mm. So they're in a community setting, they have an asset from the hospital, they take that home, sometimes fairly long term, they have, they have consumables that they come and change at very regular uh, frequencies. And basically, we knew, we, so everybody who, who offered to help, and we're very grateful, this, this is not uh, being judgmental, but everybody who offered to, to make a ventilator when we required them in the early stages, because nobody had the amount of ventilators that was needed, so people who made vacuum cleaners decided to make ventilators, and we're yeah. grateful for that, yeah. we're grateful. But they didn't all work as mm. we expected to. And six months later, some of them required a recall, a product recall. And they needed them urgently because they've got them on patients that potentially are out in the community. We were able to, within two hours, identify every patient with a ventilator right. that was affected across over 400 products. Not a single hour of nursing time mm. was spent. And that was instant. You know, we basically said, yeah. this ventilator, these serial codes, and this patient is in this location. So we could give that data back to that head of service who could contact those patients that day. That's incredible. 
That's impressive. We, that we couldn't mm. do that without Scan for Safety because mm. we'd have never scanned the product out in the first place mm. with the GIAI code, which is an asset code, very similar to a GTIN book for a, for a physical piece of equipment. We can't do that via paper mechanics because we've given out so many ventilators. We've had some of them back. Some of them have been sent back to other patients. Some of them were in clinical um, you know, engineering. They were being repaired. Some of them were on the shelf. You can't do that with a paper exercise you've got to have a digital system which is responsive to what you are requiring the data to deliver that that scan for safety that i mean that's a tremendous example isn't it of uh, what you can achieve it's yeah. fantastic yeah. and yet you think of the other trust who would be faced with similar pressures and challenges who wouldn't have been able to do it well, we were told um, by several manufacturers that the, the several hospitals had really struggled even eight weeks later to trace mm. them because it was a paper exercise. Yeah. And of course, the hospital was incredibly busy at that point. So uh, administrators were busy trying to understand lots of other problems. Um, mm. But yeah, we were able to do it in less than two hours. So let me ask you, um, you know, the whole the first session, one of the real challenges is basically how we can encourage um, NHS Trust to adopt scan for safety yeah. and indeed um, it's the same Sarah would argue in relation to procurement supply of chains course. but how do you convince clinicians yeah. first of all at the point of care level yes. but also the the chief executive yes. and the finance how can you convince them yeah. that they really need to go with this. Yeah. What, what, what is the magic ingredient, <laughs> would you say? So, so you, do need, you do need to leverage certain parts of your mm. hospital. You need to understand your culture and where the problems sit, because you need to solve the problem. So if your problem in your hospital is around lack of traceability and you've been picked up by CQC on it, everybody will want to listen. If you've been picked up on overspending and the amount of expired stock that's going out of date, everybody mm. will want to listen. But you need to understand the culture of your individual hospital and you almost need to solve the problems because Scan for Safety can solve problems because you do not buy product put on a shelf. You buy product for a patient. You can't manage a patient without product. And as a result, that's the connection between point of care and inventory management. That is the leverage that you need to understand and almost explode to your culture of what problems are you solving at your trust. Because every trust is different. Some are much bigger than others. Some have a different hierarchy. Some have different structures. Some have different IT. And some have different budgets and how they're spent. So understand, are you going to drive it from patient safety? Is that the big area? And therefore, your chief nurse and your chief operating officer are interested. Are you going to drive it from a cost perspective and get your finance director on board? Or are you, have you had such bad press recently that your chief executive just needs this problem solving because he's been harangued by journalists on a regular basis? Because once you solve that problem, you have the exec's attention, but you have to use Scan for Safety to solve the problems. And the clinicians come on board because one of my senior clinicians who leads cardiothoracic in my hospital said to me, I would do this if you can tell me what my colleagues in all of these four theatres are doing whilst I'm in another theatre, because I don't have visibility to that right now, but I do have to sign off the activity reports and the budget reports at the end of every month, so how do I know what I'm signing? The answer is he didn't, but he does now. So his problem has been solved by transparency and visibility. So I said to him, is this what you want? Absolutely. Well, I'll give you that. We will deliver that for you. And we did. And we do. And it continues to be to this day. So he knows what he's spent. He knows how many patients have gone through. He knows what activity we've had. He can explain differences in data that drops up and down. And that's the difference. That's, uh, thank you. I mean, that, that's a brilliant exposition of how to do it. Right, let me open this up to colleagues. Um, Who'd like to uh, make a point or ask a question? Yes. We can't see because no. of the because uh, <laughs> of the light. So I, I'm relying on you to uh, come on in. I'm 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 in. I has yes. Um, is that so? Oh, thank you. Thank you very you much. Me? Is it okay? Uh, my name's Veronica. I work at Somerset NHS Foundation Trust, and it's reference supply chain. So in our inventory system. We stock over 10,000 unique lines. And we've had quite a few conversations with supply chain because at one point we had 10% of lines 
not available, back order, out of stock. And often the systems available with supply chain are not consistent with communicating if that product's not available, um, saying it's in stock when it isn't or it isn't delivered, but, but we didn't know that because the system's not saying that. So I really want to know what supply chain is doing to improve that because it's affecting clinical care. I think, Sarah, that's for you. <laughs> when, when I talked about the resilience slide, hopefully that starts to paint a bit of a picture. I think there are multiple things we're doing, and I think we recognise that we are, we're not where we would like to be, but equally we're all, we're all collectively operating in an environment that's incredibly challenging. So I think the, the pilot I referred to at the very end, um, the one that's being led um, and co-created, co as it were, with Oxford and UCLH, is really trying to address the points and the problems that you're alluding to. Um, and it's coming at it from what are the orders that are placed and working through using Lean Six Sigma principles very mechanistically to say, okay, was that, were all those lines transferred? Have we been able to pick? Um, or what are the challenges? And I think um, approaching it with that sort of scientific rigor, we're finding a couple of issues that we, we need to solve on our side, but also there's a, there's a procedural aspect for how trusts work with us that needs to resolve itself as well. And we need our new technologies to be able to proactively communicate before things need to be delisted or before we expect stock outs um, to be able to say to you, we're having a challenge and here are your alternatives and then what would you like to do in advance? So that's, that's where we're trying to get to, but it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle with a dependency on a tech project from us, um, you know, needing to find the outcomes of this particular pilot and then, and then share and scale the, uh, the points that we need to collectively resolve um, and then more, more strategically manage, manage the resilience of those supply chains in a more, I guess, hands-on way given where we are right here, right now. But happy to chat separately if you've still got questions. So, could you just say a little bit more about kind of communications between yourselves and, and people in the service and how you see that developing? Yeah, it's a really good question, actually. I think um, it's, it's, it's really important to us that we have open, honest, transparent dialogue with our, with our customers um, because I think, you know, you will see things and, and find things that, that we see differently and actually only by working together will we have the best possible picture of what's going on in the supply chains at the moment. Um, as a consequence of the pilot I've just talked about, we have actually changed some of our operational communication protocols. So we have something called the important customer notice, which goes out when there are challenges. Um, but actually we've introduced a new, and I've forgotten what the document's called, we've introduced a new document that goes out now to preemptively notify people where we're expecting potential challenges to arise. So we're starting to move towards a more proactive uh, means of alerting people. But I think there's a little bit chicken and egg there because if we say that there might be a risk over here, then what does that do to people's ordering patterns? So it's mm. trying to, in a, in a measured, and mannered, uh, measured and controlled way, um, share as much as we possibly can in, in a more proactive style than perhaps we've been able to in the past. Um, but I think this is where the end-to-end -end visibility piece comes in, that actually if we do have the ability to look across system inventory in total, um, then again, that I think will also help with us being able to better manage um, different resilience strategies to, to support. So I think comms is part of the answer. I think supply chain strategy and resilience is another part of the answer. And it's a two-way dialogue, I guess, is what I'm encouraging. Okay, Hannah, did you want to... No, I mean, I think the only thing I would mm. add to that is that I think also being clear about how that demand signal translates into the manufacturers. Yes. I think is, that's often a step that's not very easily done either. So they are often struggling, saying, I don't actually know where the demand comes from or what's happening. Uh, and so they, they also have the same issue about how do we create safety stock? How much do we do? Where do we, where do we, do we need to put a new manufacturing line in to do this? Yes or no. So I think being clear about what the drivers of that demand are and making that part of the communication will also help. Thank you. Ulrika, um, from a global perspective, um, you've been an observer of um, how we've been doing in the NHS. As you know, I mean, this is, GS1 is, this is the second, uh, GS1 tried engaging in the health service 20 years ago and uh, it didn't work. And this is the second approach, which clearly um, we think is making great progress. But I mean, how would you compare us globally? And what are the lessons do you think we can learn to embed 
both the supply chain efficiencies, but also the safety elements using standards in the way that we've seen described today? So first of all, like I have always been very frank about, I think you are doing great um, because uh, you have really the, the hospitals driving the implementation and where we struggle off on a global level is that regulatory bodies are mandating the identification of products, but then it's not used. So to really drive implementation on the hospital side is a really difficult part. And I really honestly admire what uh, is happening in the UK since so many years. It takes time, I know that. I, I'm a, I've worked long in a hospital myself and I know that things in a hospital move slowly. In healthcare, we are very careful with changing any processes because it is about patient treatment. Mm. So you don't want to make any mistake. But on the other side, we are also very consistent. If we have implemented something, then, then we do it also. But I think um, I still am I'm astonished always when I'm coming to your conferences and I hear the stories. I would love uh, if you would publish more about this. I mean, really, the stories uh, and the experience which we have heard alone this morning and now mm. from you, this is something which I would love to just take out into the world because your experience could help so many colleagues in other parts of the world which are struggling with the same issues. I mean, if I look at hospitals across the world, it's not so different, really, what the issues are which they are fighting with. So if we could somehow take the experience, the implementation which you're doing here and share that across the world, that would just be fantastic. I have two things in my mind. One is the example that uh, Kelsey gave this morning yes, about exactly. a trust that um, pay epoch exactly. cost itself within two months. Exactly. And That's then Rachel's the example like. of ventilators and um, the recall within minutes, essentially. Yes. Um, it's things like that, isn't it, that conveys the picture that we, we need to get across. And I think you need to get it across in the NHS. Um, at, from my very egoistic point of view, also in the world. Thank you. Can, can yes. I maybe just add one perspective? What I find interesting, if I, if I broaden this, I mean, again, if you look at countries like Germany, which were very fragmented, which even from a vaccine perspective, we're unable to even understand, even on a weekly basis, what the infection rates are, what the vaccination rates are. So what was the strength at the beginning, the fragmentation, turned out to be a real weakness and still continues to be. So they, they have similar conferences on, you know, on trying to say, how do we build better national data? But I think from, from, a, from a UK perspective, I think this, the challenge around how to scale what Rachel was talking about to other hospitals, I think has been, at least in my experience, quite endemic. And the question and the challenge is, how do you do that? What is the right unit of analysis for scale? Um, because we know that at an NHS level, it, you know, saying do it this way is quite difficult to get everybody to move in that direction. Doing it one hospital at a time may yield very different and fragmented solutions. So what is the right solution? And will the ICSs be the best way forward? I don't know. But I think that to me, I think, to the publication point, I think is a really important challenge. Thing. I think, uh, my experience is there is no right way, but whatever you do, uh, there will always be challenges. Um, you can restructure, but um, how many restructurings of the NHS has there been since 1948? Um, there'd be many. Absolutely. And the NHS is a, a I was going to say curious organisation. It, it, it's sort of... Uh, it's unusual in, uh, I think many people looking from the outside see the words NHS and believe it's one organisation. Yes. But the reality is, I mean, I mean, how many hundreds of organisations are there? If you include GP practices, there are thousands, yes, absolutely. all of whom bear the NHS imprint. Mm -hmm. And you can as a minister, my experience as a minister, yes, there are certain things you can do and say, this will happen. But actually, there's only a very, very limited number. Uh, and therefore, it's combination, isn't it? It's leverage, Rachel. 
and it, it sticks carrots, cajoling, praying sometimes, um, encouraging, providing examples of good standard. I think it's interesting the German experience because, as ever, we we you know we know we always know that our problems, mm -hmm. but actually we've also got a lot going for us Absolutely. because, yes. however disparate we sometimes think the NH is, actually our ability to pull mm. things together using digital transformation, which increasingly we're going to do, should give us huge potential uh, in, in the future. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure what the question was, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we, we started essentially with a direct question about supply chain issues, but We've gone on an interesting journey since then. Now, has anyone else got some points they want to put at this stage? Don't think you're going to get lunch yet, by the way, if you don't ask questions, because <laughs> it ain't ready yet. Yes, sir. Hi there. Jack Panay from One World Sync. We're a partner, uh, official partner of uh, GS1. Um, thanks for the uh, session. So I've been working for 25 years in the consumer electronics space and CPG space. And we've seen legislation come in, for example, with energy label. So there was a soft launch by the EU directive to enforce the energy label for energy conscious customers. And it forced manufacturers to think about how they manufacture devices. There's a famous reference to Dyson, etc. So we've always been there in making sure that our customers who are retailers and distributors and manufacturers are providing the data and syndicating it out to support the consumer in their decision-making process. And what we found was that nobody really took the legislation serious. And even though they saw the benefits and the costs savings, they never really went ahead with displaying energy label. So then the EU directive changed four years later to a mandate mm. and a penalty. And then all of a sudden we had customers approaching us and saying, Jack, we really need your help. We really need your help because we're going to get fined. And so now that I'm entering into the healthcare side of things and the experience that we've had, I, I think after hearing everything that I've heard so far, we've got a standard here that's trusted, right? We've heard about trust. We've heard about the benefits with the ventilator and how it helped audit in and quick, you know, a quick recovery in a, you know, a sensitive situation. So. I think it's time that we just mandate this. You know, talking about the NHS being very dispersed um, is, is equivalent to what we experience with the energy label with thousands of customers in Europe. So I think mandating this and having a global system with the GS1 standard is the only way forward. However, it won't happen overnight. You'll still have some trust that are slower to adoption. But I think really it's up to the government to mandate it to really take it forward. Thank you. Um, really interesting question. Um, and kind of an observation for someone coming into the healthcare system uh, and seeing with experience from another sector. Um, I, I guess, Sarah, I've got to put it to you first. I mean, in a sense, it is mandated. It, it, or at least one can, we could go through the different threads yeah. and you could see elements of mandation. It's not in one place and it's not performance managed, I would guess. Yep. Uh, and, we, uh, and we as an organisation, as NHS Supply Chain, have been having all sorts of debates over the last six months about our role and our stance vis-a-vis -vis the system, vis-a-vis -vis how we help trusts on this journey. Um, and I think you know, there, are, there are different views within our own organisation, actually, where, where you mandate something and it's not adopted and it's not embraced and it's, it doesn't deliver benefits, it, it won't last, you know, or, it, or it won't deliver what it's supposed to deliver. Um, I think there is a, a, an expectation and anticipation around the end of the consultation process with the NHRA, um, and I think that, for me, will, will release a number of organisations to make decisions and, and, and force people to think about how they um, report the information that's required in the MDIS system. But, but I do sense that there's a growing momentum and a growing sense, and I think Simon captured the point, that actually now does feel like a, you know, the best time we've had in some time 
to, to, to force the issue. And whether it's mandated or not, I, I guess I, I don't mm. think mandating things is necessarily the right answer. I think it's storytelling and sharing and making sure people understand the benefits, mm. all the parties in the system that have to deliver this. Um, so so yeah. I don't think we have proper mandation. I think we're, we're waiting for a little more clarity and then I think we collectively need to push in an aligned way. I, I guess one of my observations is the system is so incredibly busy on the clinical front, on the non-clinical front. There are so many conflicting priorities that actually to have a single roadmap and to collectively sign up to that roadmap will be our best chance of trying to move. So um, I was once minister for targets in the <laughs> Department of Health. And um, we had fun because... Uh, we asked officials, well, how many targets have we actually set? This was beginning of 2000s. And, you know, by the time they reached 465, we stopped it. And interestingly, it, it was a foundation for establishing NHS Foundation Trusts. And the idea of going for very high-level targets, like four-hour A&E, 18-week wake for elective care, 62-day cap, etc., and trying to lessen the everyday business. And, I mean, the reality is that it hit the sand because, really, Foundation Trust never really were given the freedoms that they were promised to start with. And ministers continued, as they are today, to be under huge pressure all the time from all sorts of very good people to prioritise their particular issue. It does strike me, though, that with that's always going to be, once you have a National Health Service funded by, by the public through Parliament and taxes, there's always going to be that kind of ministerial um, oversight. But I think what we're talking about here is part of the architecture. Uh, and the mandation of the architecture under which everyone operates is, I think, fruitful territory. I don't know what you think, Rachel, yeah, there. absolutely, and I think... I was talking to my colleague, actually, uh, Heather Jakes, sat over there just a few moments ago before I joined the session, and we, we were actually commenting on the fact that now barcodes are everywhere, mm. everywhere you go. Um, you can now walk through a supermarket that has no staff without, without kind of talking to anybody and you've paid and walked out That's and yet we still idyllic thought didn't yeah it? absolutely and uh, you know, <laughs> but but ultimately we can't get a barcode on a product what what so with the nhs and we buy all these products and we don't have barcodes even to this day in hull if any of you go we have less than 80 percent compliance from our suppliers that actually deliver GS1 standards. And we lobby them. You know, George Lawton, who I speak to lots at, at GS1, she knows this. We held a supplier summit. We got everybody in a room and almost dictated to them that, look, this is what we are doing. This is what we're going to be. We had a full day of session of different clinicians there talking about what this looks like. And, and for the areas, actually, it does have an impact on where you can go live. Because if they have nothing to scan, how can you implement a scanning solution? How do you do that? The answer is you don't. So we need the suppliers to get on board, but we also need everybody that plays their part because it almost feels like um, sort of a shared picnic bench that everybody has to come to eat together. We have to do it together because we have to leverage both the, the legislation that we've got we also have to leverage the procurement that we've got. We've got a brand new NHS Digital MDIS coming into force, which will also help this piece. We've got new reporting requirements coming in from NHS Digital around pop sui data. So we need this. But do you know who needs this most? The patient. Because it drives me wild when I can't say to somebody, this is what you've had. This is what you've had done by this person. When I say, I'm really sorry, but this supplier, don't, they don't put barcodes on, so I'm really sorry. I can only give you three quarters of the story. What mm. nonsense. It needs to stop. We need to collaborate to get this together because the patient struggles. So when it's your mum that comes in for a hip replacement at 82, mm. and we can't tell her what everything was and where, where it all happened because somebody hasn't put barcodes on. Are we all happy about that? Really? Well, I'm not. I'm not at all. So, no. I 
I think that's the last word, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes. Have you seen someone? Have right at the back. Oh, sorry, yes. I, I love what you've just said, and I, and I love the Dyson story, because I think about it as my nan, my mum, etc., and I've worked in pharmacy, and I'm a supplier. Is it not a case of... I'm, I'm, I kind of agree with the mandate thing, but just explain to suppliers that we have two years or 18 months or three years or whatever it may take to get rid of the old expiry product and we have to otherwise you will not accept it and then we will all do it we did it with fmd in in the pharmaceutical sector now we can argue whether or not we should have continued with that but can you not just sit there and say to all the suppliers as of now you've got three years and it's tough. If you don't do it, we won't use your hip replacement. We won't use your pharmaceuticals. We won't use, yeah. etc. I don't see what the problem is. As a supplier, yeah. I don't want to spend the extra money, but I'll spend it if, everyone if has to. Yeah. it's yeah. mandated and everyone has to follow the same rule, not we're going yeah. to extend it for another year. And it's a really valid point, but it's not, it's not on its own. It's not an isolated issue because when I buy implants, I also buy loan kits to match them for tools that put them in somebody's hip and if I don't have corresponding loan kits for the new product because I'm no longer going to buy your products it doesn't have a barcode on do I have enough of the new loan kits from a barcoded supplier or not have the staff been trained or not have we got recovery beds that require certain things in certain methods because we have to recover them in different ways or not it is not a simple barcode it is an operational piece that People don't realise that a barcode, and I'm totally with you, if we set this and say three years from today we will do it, that gives us time to build our ammunition of our, of our tools and our resources that we need. But you need to give us a little bit of time to reflect on that as well because obviously we also need to add the data into the systems. And it's not just one item, it's thousands of items. And of course you might have a GTIN for the individual product, one for the box, one for the palette. So it might be times three. You know, and, and Sarah's got to do it the same yeah. at mm. supply chain. She's got to make sure that all those GTINs are correct, that we have the right product. So I get it, and I absolutely support what you're saying. If you want to do it, do you know what? Come and talk to me about it. I will, I will absolutely help you get that sorted. But we do need to make sure that operationally at the hospitals, it's not just a flick of a key, because for us, there is a user piece, which is a knock-on effect at a clinical side that has to be considered. And we do have to make sure that happens. Anything you want to add, Sarah? I'm on the same page as Rachel. I Great. think we need to work in concert together. Thank you. I, there, I think there was a, another hand up there. Yeah, thank you. Make this the Hi final there. one. Great presentation. I love your passion. So I'm speaking to you from the supplier perspective, Layla McMahon from Smith & Nephew. And we have done it. We want to work with NHS, and we love working with NHS. And as part of the e-procurement strategy, if you remember many moons ago, we as suppliers have been asked to work together with NHS to barcode everything, to bring to the GS1 standards, to publish into GDSN. So I have to support the comment from this gentleman that why can't you give a timeline to the suppliers that are not being compliant with your ask and maybe work with the suppliers that are actually meeting the requirements and the standards and thinking of our patients and patient safety. Thank you. Now I'm going to ask Glenn to come up. And while, I, while Glenn's coming up, I just want to thank my colleagues for such a great session, for the speeches, for the contribution of Rachel. It's been fantastic. And, uh, I, 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 you know, I sense everyone's frustration. I mean, we've been at this now for about 10 years and uh, we are frustrated, but, but we also have to acknowledge that there's huge progress that has been made too. And I think we just have to remember that as well. Thank you.